Well, good morning and or good afternoon, as the case might be. Welcome and or welcome back. Again, as the case might be. Um, my name is Dalibor Petrovic. I'm a partner at Deloitte in Canada, and I had a pleasure of being host um, at this channel and our, our live webcast channel for the last couple of years, uh, through which we brought and keep bringing uh, both conversations with technology executives shaping the future of Canada, but also bringing to you programming that we think is important and relevant, which is what this particular session is going to be about. Um, as you may recall, we are uh, launching Deloitte Tech Trends 2023 in a series of live webcasts. And today is one of those sessions where we are going to go into a deeper dive in one of our six tech trends. This session is intended to be about an hour long, and we are doing them live for a very specific reason. We would like to engage with you, the audience members, and give you an opportunity to ask questions to our panelists. So please feel free to submit your questions using the Q&A function of this platform. Um, so let's delve right into it today. We're going to be touching on the topic of artificial intelligence. Um, as our second trend of six, um, trend entitled Opening Up to AI. And I am really thrilled and privileged to be joined by a wonderful panel of experts. Um, first, I'm going to briefly introduce Bina. Bina is a head of Deloitte's Global AI Institute. She is also the author of Trustworthy AI, uh, a recently published book on this critically important topic, and she also leads our trustworthy AI and tech practice. So most of the time um, and, and energy and thought Bina spends on, on, on this critical interaction of trustworthiness uh, of AI and other technologies as they, as they converge. So Bina, thank you so much for finding time to join us. Uh, Bina, you're joining us today from San Francisco. Uh, Next, Nihar Dalmia, my partner from Deloitte Canada. Uh, Nihar is a leader of Deloitte, Deloitte Canada's Omnia AI practice. And Nihar, you are, of course, we've been, we've been friends and working together for, for, for many, many years. You will be able to provide Canadian context to this conversation. Nihar is a partner at Deloitte. And I'm always very impressed and I'm thrilled to sort of give just a couple of data points about Nihar. He brings uh, an MBA from Oxford and a Master of Science MIT focused on analytics. Um, so thrilled to have you with us. Uh, thank you for your time. And lastly, but certainly not leastly, um, our global chief, tech, chief futurist, Mike Bechtel, a familiar face uh, in our programs, uh, Mike, you are joining us, I, I understand, from San Diego, sunny San Diego, California today. Um, so thank you all very much. What we're going to do today is we're going to start the session with a bit of a preamble, and I will invite Mike to share with us the general concept of, of tech trends, why we do it, how we do it, and how these tech trends emerged this year. And then we are going to invite Bina, Nihar, and Mike to, of course, unfold this particular trend around artificial intelligence. So with that, I'm going to pass the baton over to you, Mike, to, uh, to take us away. Well, Dalibor, I, uh, I would I agree with everything you said, except for the not leastly in my introduction, because uh, I, I, I feel... Uh, uh, humbled in the proper sense of the word, not the honorific, honorific <laughs> Oscars and Tony sense of the word, to be to be with Bina and Nihar today, uh, two real uh, Jedi uh, in this space, folks. Um, hello from sunny San Diego. For those who who are used to seeing me uh, in the home office with the bookcase of credibility, uh, I, I've I've traded uh, I've traded comfort for um, vitamin D, and it's a pleasure to be with you all today. Um, in the spirit of that preamble that Dalibor spoke to, um, as, as a quick baseline, Deloitte Tech Trends is in its 14th year. 
we are in the business of helping our clients make sense of what's new and next in tech. And our clients are both technology leaders and business leaders, right? I like to say that uh, done correctly, um, we're helping folks uh, from the boardroom all the way over to the server room. And so uh, this year's tech trends, and, and frankly, all of our tech trends are anchored in this recognition that the whole history of IT has been a series of evolutions, not revolutions, along three enduring tracks that have mattered since the first computer in the 1860s, right? 1840s, actually. Um, the thought is that every IT system worth its salt has been a story of simpler interactions, right? more intelligent information and insights, knowledge extraction, right? And then finally, more capable, more abundant, more plentiful processing, number crunching, uh, the, the math that makes the party go. And the reason I open with this, folks, is that there's this great old quote from Larry Tesler, who's a computer scientist, researcher at um, Xerox Park. He invented copy paste, uh, which as far as I'm concerned, puts him in the geek hall of fame. Um, he said, listen, AI is whatever computers can't do yet. And, and if you think about that, that's, that's a really clever and I think appropriate description because once upon a time, artificial intelligence, what was a machine that could do arithmetic? Because that's, that's artificial and it's intelligent. And you know, 40 years later, it was descriptive analytics. Let's look at patterns in our old data, right? Five years ago, it was, well, let's predict and project and figure out what's coming next in our data. Well, the reason AI has gotten, in, in my opinion, and per our research, um, so much attention lately is it's turned this corner from critic over the shoulder, right? From, from guide on the side to co-pilot, right? Mechanical minds have turned this corner from from sort of perspective giver that you might choose not to listen to, to having agency. And if you're giving something agency, you have to understand it, you have to trust it, right? Because we certainly can't um, work with an inscrutable algorithm that, that, that is a black box and makes no sense. And so as we talk through with, with Vina and, and with Nihar today, as we talk through what's new in AI, it's not the idea that AI is new. It's the recognition that AI has gotten to a point of facility of efficacy where perhaps trust trumps tech, right? Perhaps our ability to understand and believe in the actions of our inorganic colleagues is as much of a limiting reagent as those algorithms themselves. Now that said, folks, Tech Trends is a story of breadth and interconnection, right? Our information focus, our intelligence focus today is one of these six slivers, right? Those who joined our prior session will remember we talked about the metaverse, not as, a, not as, not as interesting because it's shiny, but interesting because it makes interactions simpler, right? A couple of weeks from now, we'll talk about what's new in cloud, right? And the idea of meta cloud, the idea of getting above cloud complexity and into something approaching elegance and sophistication and simplicity, right? A couple of weeks after that, we'll start talking about our grounding forces, right? The idea that um, the cost of leading, the responsibility of leading an established successful organization like many of yours is that you can't just pioneer. It's not all blue sky. And hence this green grass on the bottom, right? Understanding the business and finance side of tech. Right? understanding the what could go wrong side of cyber and risk, right? And then understanding how you're going to get these rusty but trusty old school systems that you already have, right? These sunk costs to play nicely with tomorrow's tools. But today, today's really the story about AI and trusting AI. And so let's dig in, right? Uh, mercifully, a little for me in the way of setup and then over to, um, to Bina and Nihar for a, hopefully, or a, a, not hopefully, absolutely a righteous discussion. So, so on the information front, for starters, 
right? And I hit this point for some of us a couple of weeks back. Um, this artwork you see in front of you, this, this Hellenic oil painting energy um, brought to you by a generative AI, right? In the spirit of walking that talk, we designed the artwork for this year's Tech Trends in partnership with generative right, uh, image diffusion technologies. Now, just as per the theme of this trend, uh, the tech was maybe the easy part, right? The trust was the hard part. Imagine telling your designers, your creative team, um, hey, hey, uh, gang, um, how about we have robots do some of your stuff, right? The body rejects that organ pretty quick. Oh, heck no, right? You want me to work with, let alone give my role to a robot? Well, no, we want you to team, to collaborate as, as, as we call it. And, and, and my friend and colleague Bina says so well, this is about with, not versus. This is the age of with. And so this idea of after this lived experience, right? Three months in, our design team realizing that generative AI tools are not a threat as much as they are the new must have tool for creatives. That was a lesson worth learning. And so it goes with business process automation, with algorithmic prose, poetry, paintings, with whatever's new in AI. The limiting reagent is less about can we do it? Should we do it? More about can we trust it at scale? And how do we know? And so some of the stories that we talked to this year in our tech trends were interesting conversations with clients you've heard of about how the adoption of AI was as much a change management problem, as much as a boardroom relevant talent problem, as it was a technology and soldering guns kind of a problem. Consider American Airlines. We spoke with American Airlines a few months back. They said, listen, we've had folks working from 10 p.m. till 2 a.m. every night, overnight, to manually assign planes to gates. They call it gating. And they're really good at it, but sort of repetitive. It's in the dark, right? The job was interesting, but the tasks that comprised the job were sometimes less than interesting. And so they had a recognition, they said, if we try to bring an AI ML model into the mix, if we foist that on folks, they're likely to push back, right? That feels like something is being done to you. And uh, people, people, professionals don't like that. And so appropriately, respectfully, they worked with these gating agents and they said, would you be interested in co-creating an in silico decision tree model that reflects your expertise and critically can automate pieces of your expertise, not to replace you, but to elevate you, right? To allow you to work during the daytime in the sunlight on higher order problems, problems that, that elevate and inspire, like helping people miss misconnections and dealing with weather delays, as opposed to, again, that rote repeatable night work. Well, people support what they help create. Right? And so what American found was that um, this turned the narrative from uh, robots coming for jobs to robots helping with tasks and allowing us to elevate into even better roles. Now, the Saudi Tourism Authority had a different side of that coin. They said, listen, we are increasingly committed to becoming a world-class tourist destination. But when people come to Saudi Arabia, they don't necessarily know where to start, where to go, what to see, because it's so new, it's so novel. Mm. Well, enter AIML. The recognition that with an explainable and permissions managed set of algorithms, folks could opt in to share their interests and in some of their, you know, things like search history, things like travel itinerary. And the Kingdom of Saudi Arabia could automatically recommend bespoke touring plans based on that intel. Now, what's so interesting there is, again, the trust factor. It's not sneaky. It's not 
um, give us all your data and we'll give you a little value. It's, would you be interested in giving some of your data in exchange for transactional trust in exchange for a better experience? Right. And this idea of transitive or transactional trust as a, of a continuum, right? Of give a little, get a little, give medium, get medium, give a lot, get a lot. That helps reframe the game, right? Around what it means to share data and receive value. And so in, in summary, you know, as, as regards my preamble before we move into righteous conversation, um, AI isn't new, right? But it's reached an inflection point where it's being used to not just advise, but automate. The problem has been these things are black boxes. They're inscrutable. How do you know what's going on in there? Well, the answer is make them glass boxes, make them understandable, explainable, auditable, governable, right? Because in a world where next is coming today, right? Where large language models, where generative AI, where digital painters and poets are going from curiosity to dinner room conversation, we're not going to use any of this unless we feel good about trusting it. So folks, um, and Bina and, and Nihar specifically, over to you and would love to see what, what you're seeing on the true front lines of innovation in this space. Mike, thank you so much. And you touched so many different aspects of trust. I think uh, you know, the key factors to remember is if we focus on trust, we can actually solve for it. Uh, when we talk about just the challenges, the ethical implications and the philosophical discussions, it becomes really hard to get our arms around it and operationalize it in an enterprise to bring the true power of AI by putting the guardrails in place. You need to define what trust means for your organization for a specific use case, whether it is you know, a black box, being able to explain the algorithms, uh, making it more reliable, make it more transparent and fair, it actually all depends on the use case and the scenario that it's going to be used for. Uh, for example, if you are using uh, uh, AI to, um, for, let's take you know something that's uh, that you all have heard of, facial recognition. If you're using facial recognition software in a law enforcement scenario and bias comes into play, that's a terrible scenario. You absolutely do not want any kind of biased. AI model out there in the world, you know, tagging somebody with sub tags that that will impact their lives forever. So, but that exact same technology can be used in another scenario, and it is being used today to identify kidnapping victims or human trafficking victims to rescue them. So, from a use case perspective, in that case, the question to ask is, what is acceptable? If it's helping us rescue 60% more than we could if we didn't use AI, should we still be using that AI? And that's why it's the one thing that I want you all to take away is the trust factor, the dimensions of trust that's important will be at the use case level, not at the high level. The other aspect that I'll touch on is, you know, reliability. We don't, uh, you know, we talk about software reliability. We've always talked about reliability, but reliability takes a different term in the world of AI and machine learning, because this is a way of software that's constantly learning, that the outcomes cannot be completely predicted. So how putting in the right guardrails to make sure the outcomes are consistent and reliable in your enterprise, in the use case that you're working on, again, comes to the forefront. The last aspect I'll touch on is, uh, the, you know, uh, from a future of work perspective, which is very important when you think about the employees who are teaming up to co-create AI. It's really important to get that employee engagement and also define what does the future of work look like providing them the training to use these new technologies, making sure they're on board from the, from the creation perspective to the actual user mode, that they're fully equipped to use those technology to provide that next wave of features that, they, that might spark in their mind if they understood, understood AI enough. So providing AI fluency is another crucial factor. So you know, Nihar, I would love to welcome your perspective uh, so Deloitte uh, uh, and Dalibor, you introduced so well. Uh, uh, Nihar leads our Omnia AI platform from Canada, and I would love to hear your thoughts. Yeah, thanks, Bina. Hard to follow up with 
I can be now most times, but I'll I'll try to bring this sort of to what what it means for our Canadian organizations and folks here in this country. So as Bina mentioned, there's a lot to unpack when you think about how do you build trust in AI and why is that important? You know, I'll just talk about a few things we're seeing here in Canada on how organizations are tackling this problem. Um, and Bina touched upon this. The number one thing we're seeing is investing in building awareness, investing in um, breaking some of the myths around AI. And so we're seeing every organization we're working with, uh, they're starting to invest in bringing AI education across their organization from the bottom to executives. And that, that's, that really starts to create um, um, not just awareness and what AI can, can do or cannot do, but also take away some of the fear around what AI, what some of the side effects AI can have. Uh, the second thing we're seeing is there's mixed feelings, as all of us know, around the potential of AI. Uh, concerns about privacy, job loss, ethical considerations, and that's completely valid. Um, there's that overarching feeling across industries around what can what will AI do, some of the side effects around it. And you know, generally what we've seen is back to what Mike was saying, if you know, a lot of the applications of AI we're seeing today are are really AI being an assistant or a co-pilot to humans as opposed to taking over their jobs. We we are seeing almost no use cases or examples where a client even is even considering replacing a job completely with AI. And we don't see that happening in the near future either. Um, the third point I'd say what we're seeing in Canada is the understanding of AI and what it can do is, and the trends around it is varies by, by age, demo, demographics across the country, and just the adoption of technology. Um, so, you know, we, we're talking about AI, but, you know, if you think about other exponential technologies like the metaverse, uh, Web3, others that digital twins that we're talking about, we're starting to see that, um, as these technologies are being adopted, AI is almost embedded across many of these technologies. Mm -hmm. And so a lot, you know, our clients may not even talk about AI, but AI by, by itself is embedded in many of these technologies that apply to various problems that they're trying to solve. And so just educating different demographics on what these technologies are and how AI can help promote uh, these technologies and by itself helps build trust in AI. Uh, the last thing I would say is transparency. So transparency is transparency in data. And Bina touched upon this as well. Um, Canadian organizations are finally, I mean, I think this is a trend that we're seeing over the last couple of years, but it's really accelerated over the last uh, 12 months or so. Canadian organizations are spending a a lot of money on making sure that the data is transparent and good. Um, so spending um, energy and time in making sure that there's good data governance practices, good master data practices, and the data platform is um, robust enough to create more transparency in data. That really helps build the confidence that the algorithms that will use the data can be trusted. And so building trust in data is becoming more and more important as, as much as building trust in the algorithms that use the data. And then the last thing I would touch upon is, you know, just because I, I focus in uh, a lot of my time and energy working with governments across Canada, um, governments are becoming more and more open to understanding the potential of AI because not only are they seeing it being applied across industries, and there's a reason for them to regulate, but also promote the use of AI in the right places, governments themselves are seeing the need to adopt AI to become more efficient. And we're seeing that across the board from provinces to the federal government on using AI to do things like reducing backlogs, improving efficiency of employees, improving the experience of onboarding employees, and being more transparent, just being more transparent to Canadians. and 
uh, we see this trend growing more and more. So that those yeah. are just some points I wanted to highlight, Bina. Nihar, you bring up such a great point, uh, and you know I just want to put this out there to the audiences. You know, today we are talking about AI and trust, but as AI gets more and more infused and converges with other technologies, it's really about trust of any kind of technology that we might be using. These technologies are coming at us faster than ever before. So it's pro you know, to proactively think about trust, you know, starting with AI, but thinking about trust with other technologies is equally important. I, I couldn't agree more. I just, I, you know, in, in our tech trends research this year, to your point, Vina, um, virtually every, emerging technology domain we looked at had this meaningful technology trust and ethics component. And I was in a session with, with our team of futurists just yesterday here, why I'm here in San Diego. And it, one of our young professionals said in a way that, that really stuck with me that, you know, I, our job isn't to necessarily promote the adoption of these emerging texts so much as to help our clients figure out the the pros, the cons, the neutrals, and the, the broader implications, right? That that projection of what's next doesn't equate to promotion yeah. of what's next. And I just thought that was so eye-opening. And, and you said it so well that it it really is becoming the the fulcrum of the conversation. Absolutely. And uh, here, I think as enterprises and more businesses adopt these technologies we're going to always see that next headline. We're always one headline away from the next wave that's coming. I think, uh, you know, but as enterprises start looking at these new technologies, I think there is full awareness of the risks associated with it. It's very easy to focus on the cool things technology can do. And, and if you look back, back, you know, five years ago, it was not as focused on the negative implications of technology. Now there is more focus on what are those negative implications? How can we really drive trust in AI so that you can maximize adoption? At the end of the day, if you don't trust AI, you're not going to use it. And that's not going to really help you know, I, the tool or for AI itself to make progress. Uh, An interesting perspective, uh, when you say trust in AI, um... Nikar mentioned actually a very, very, I think, good, good mental model here. You need to, first of all, have trust in the data. As we know that these systems, of course, rely on the data and outcome of the system is going to probably be proportionate to the accuracy and clarity of the data that it, that it, that it, that it works with. So there is a trust and transparency in data and there is trust and transparency in the algorithm that then works on that data to provide us with the results. But that is the that is the bowel of the system. Above that sits the organization itself, to whom people need to trust. Above that sits the institutions of our of our society to which people need to trust. And I think it is fair to say that we sadly live in a day and age when there is a general erosion of trust in those institutions. Um, I would love to get your reflections maybe being an Ikar everybody on like are there any perspectives on 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 how how do we how do we position this in that context of the overall gradual degradation of the trust of institutions where are the opportunities for organizations to emerge as trustworthy ethical yeah, and uh, Dalibor, you know, I think it's a, uh, uh, there was a big headline a few years ago on every company is a tech company. Right? Yeah. And, uh, you know, and so we have to assume that if, we, if every company is a tech company, ethical risk, the trust risk uh, have to be at the forefront. Um, so it's easier to now make sure that trust and ethics are at the juncture of every project, every solution, every tool that we build design, create using AI. Um, and uh, technology is, is, is that foundational component. And it is, uh, it's not something that can be ignored or you know, just relegated off to your IT teams. Yeah. The, um, the erosion 
of trust in organizations and interest institutions is is a thing mm-hmm. <laughs> and uh that, that's casual speak for our research validates that and um you know it, in in a couple sessions from now we're going to talk about how web3 and blockchain based technologies are quietly showing their perhaps um I don't want to say worth, I, I want to say surprising utility as a means of reflecting um, truth when you're talking about uh, organi- it, um, master data management between organizational boundaries. Mm-hmm. The, 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 this idea that, um, you know, I might not trust you, you might not trust me, but we both trust the public chain and or cryptography. But I think, Dalibor, your point, your point stands that um, uh, transparent and um, mindfully managed data running through transparent and mindfully managed algorithms is one thing, but do you trust those who are minding, you know, minding both at, at the organizational level north of that, that, that r- remains a meaningful business concern. So mm-hmm. I, I, I that's the question. Yeah. So let's maybe touch on the topic. Uh, so Nikar, you mentioned, um, you know, co- co- well, actually both, uh, Mike, you you mentioned co-piloting with AI, and Nikar, you mentioned how organizations in Canada are are, are uh, taking more and more advantage of this. Uh, while certainly there are cases where this is not causing any job losses, I think that as we project, we can certainly expect that there will be some uh, some impact. Um, I would love to get your perspectives on how should organizations think about this? How should they prepare? Is, are there good stories and examples of organizations that you were exposed to who are doing this really well that you could perhaps share with us? Yeah, the one, the one maybe I'll start there really quickly. Um, and I, I saw some com- good questions as well. Um, you know, when we say AI is going to displace jobs, I don't think that's inaccurate. I uh, partially, I think what's what's a better way to say it is AI is going to change the way we look at the skills of a job and what the composition of the job would look like in the future. And so, one um, AI is going to hopefully, likely change the profile for jobs so that we can focus on higher order tasks that we know require creativity, human intelligence, intuition, et cetera, et cetera. And I think that's that's gonna help us as a society become more productive. But also AI is gonna create new types of skills that we're gonna be needing to uh, train ourselves so that we can make them, so that we, sorry, so that we can make the most of AI as we use it in our day-to-day jobs. And that's sort of the change in paradigm that I'm seeing across organizations as I'm talking to them. Uh, I'll, I'll just add one uh, uh, you know, aspect to it. Uh, when we, um, the organizations that are being very thoughtful about that impact to jobs are going to get farther ahead and are making the most progress. What I mean by that is, uh, you know, and I, I'll use an example that I think most people on the call can relate to, right? We were looking at um, uh, predicting when an X-ray machine might fail so that you can, uh, you know, uh, you can reduce the number of downtime of the machine, reduce patient weight, you know, to see more patients and so on, right? And we obviously, you know, train the X-ray operator to be able to use this AI tool effectively to take the actions necessary whether it's calling a service agent proactively or whether it is you know, taking certain actions, rebooting the machine uh, to make sure that it doesn't fail. Uh, and you know, as technologists, you, don't, you think that you are freeing up time for this specific role. Uh, but what's on top of mind for that role is, what am I going to do with all this free time? It's not like humans are suddenly going to have more fractures and I'm going to have a, you know, more humans coming in for x-rays. So the organizations that proactively think about when you say that you know, machines are going to take away your boring tasks and free up time for you to do more creative or other elevated work, it also means 
thinking proactively about what does that elevated work look like and redefine proactively redefining that role, the task, the new task for the uh, for the human employees. Which also obviously means significant impact to training, reskilling, upskilling. Oh, yeah. right. Uh, what, what what Mike you so eloquently call creating a generation of serial specialists who should be able to pivot and redefine their roles over the over the courses of their career. This is yeah this yeah very very this is actually very important. Thanks for bringing this up. You're absolutely right. Like as as if if somebody's if if seventy percent of somebody's jobs is going to be automated, what fills it? Is 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 a is a question. I really like. I really like. I'm grateful for for that insight, Bina, because you're right. It can sound sound sort of flip, and I, I don't want to say lazy, but maybe um a little arm's length to say, oh, you know, m- m- more better jobs for people, right? It, it be, but but what what you've really helped illuminate for me with your remark there was, no, 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 no. The onus is on us as leaders. Yes. To um, create, curate, and train folks for these elevated somethings, right? They're not just going to manifest. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Yes. Right. There are a couple of questions, actually, a number of questions coming up about um, you know ethical AI principles, guidelines, yeah. policies, legislation. Can you maybe comment, Bina, wh- what's happening globally on that mm-hmm. front? Are there some guidelines yeah. standards best practices emerging yes and there are there are plenty and there are many principles or frameworks to choose one in fact deloitte has our own trustworthy ai framework and you know what i would say my advice is you know there are many best practices frameworks and principles out there it depends on your industry and use case see which one do, that aligns the most which one resonates for the mission of your organization, adopt it and run with it. Uh, globally, what we're seeing from a regulation front, obviously EU is uh, you know, farther ahead in doing regulations on uh, these emerging technologies and specifically with data, but you know, we, we are not far behind either. Uh, what we're going to see is not just one regulation or one size fits all. It has to be more nuanced than that. You know, you know, the use cases of AI are nuanced and context specific. The trust and risks of AI are nuanced and use case specific. The regulations have to be US use case specific to be most effective. So, you know, it's great. It makes very catchy headlines, but the reality is AI regulations are coming. It's going to take time just because of the level of detail thought that needs to go into it so that you don't curb innovation with blanket regulations. And there's a lot of activity happening on this front. The other aspect I'll add is, you know, we've also entered this era where regulations, it will be impossible for regulations to keep up with the pace of emerging technology, mm-hmm. right? So we companies that are thoughtful on pro- being a little bit more aware and self-regulate uh, are going to be much more successful and will be able to you know, achieve uh, the maximum impact value from AI if they can self-regulate and balance with the regulations that come in. Uh, so there is so so much information out there. I think one of the audience, you know, uh, who he's actually mentioned another framework. So I think you know, for companies who care, they are definitely looking at those frameworks, adopting those frameworks, and operationalizing it within their organizations. Mm. There's a very good question around how do we get our legal folks comfortable with this as they always keep examining, you know, what do we do if AI makes an error? So um, yeah. I'm, I'm sure these are the conversations that you are having both you, Nihar and, and Bina with, with uh, the executives that, that you work on. Um, are there any sort of, is there any general good advice on, on how to approach that aspect of, you know, executives, legal teams, risk teams saying, huh, no, I'm not comfortable. <laughs> Maybe <laughs> so, I can answer when high words, level. When words yeah. won't do. Yes. <laughs> yes. But, but we know what you mean. You know Sorry. what I mean. 
Dalibor, maybe I can do a high level. So one is that AI training, the AI fluency training is not just for, you know, it's not just for your IT team or the people who are going to use the AI that you are focused on, right? The AI fluency should be for every employee in the organization, proactive communication, making sure every employee that includes your legal and finance teams should be familiar, should be should have basic AI fluency so that they can be on board to drive that adoption. Uh, the second part is, you know, again, co-creation, making sure they, they are involved, whether you are sourcing an AI tool for your legal department or whether you're starting an AI project, you know, give them a seat at the table. They will bring in perspectives that can only make your product or tool or acquisition better. Uh, it's truly, it has to get beyond the IT teams. And this is something that, you know, to bring in uh, all the key stakeholders within the organizations to see much success. Nihar, I know you will have a lot of such stories. Yeah. Well, so, so one trend I've seen as we've, we talk about AI, you know, Donald, you and I worked with in, in your lovely province um, and AI. And what we found is the earlier you involve the right people across the organization, the more willingness there is to come to get to the table and solve the problem together. I think the mistake that sometimes are, is made is involving legal privacy risk too late in the game where you know the, 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 we missed the train on creating the consensus that's required on what's the right thing to do for the organization. And so involving that, those teams early on, having open conversations, frank discussions on what do we know, what do we not know? Because as Bina rightly mentioned, these regulations are evolving in Canada and globally, and they may not be a, the, the perfect answer to every question, but there are ways to tackle it by making sure that we get the right minds around the table. As uh, Mike mentioned in his opening remarks, I wrote this down because I think it's absolutely brilliant. People support what they help create. So that I think is 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 essentially what you're saying. Involve right, involve right people on early and let them feel a sense of creation of 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 the solution. Um, which, in, which in this case, I think what you're saying is ought to also include the risk team and the legal team and other executives who can who can contribute their perspectives and fencing if needed to make it right. I would love I would I want to definitely ask you a question: How should organizations what any perspective and advice to organizations who might not get it right and who find themselves potentially in trouble? Right. So I'm gonna. Pose that question for a few minutes to give you a chance to think about it. Um, here is an interesting, uh, may, maybe a maybe a perspective you can share on this. Uh, we know, of course, that that many cloud many cloud providers and uh, platform providers provide AI technologies that companies can subscribe to, right? Capabilities exist; you can subscribe to. The other the other option is to develop things yourselves. Um, any perspectives on what you've seen is there a is there a is there a, a right way to approach this right way to think about this is there an ip considerations issues risks if you are subscribing to somebody else's algorithms what are the pluses and minuses of developing your own and then maybe comments on that it's very practical but i think it would be useful for our audience to hear your perspectives on that it's a, it's an age old uh, question of build versus buy versus Correct. partner yeah. And, uh, you know, I've certainly dealt with that in my career. And it's, uh, the, you know, the, it, it, it again, just like with everything with AI, it depends. Do you, you know, where does it fall in the level of priority? So say, for example, right, you cannot, you need complete transparency and explainability of the AI models that you're using, that you're sourcing. Then, you know, it, and if, like, say, for example, it's a, a critical use case, like patient diagnosis and you need that complete explainability, right? Then in that case, it might, you know, look, ask the vendor for the right kind of documentation. And if you are satisfied, get your legal team involved to review, make sure you are fully confident on, you know, the behavior of that model before you source it. 
But if it is so crucial that you ca you cannot fully trust it, then you will have to you know build it in house, which means assigning your resources. So it really depends on you know the what dimensions of trust are important for your use case. So for a simple you know if you're sourcing a, a model which is not for patient diagnosis but say hospital bed mat allocation, right? Where it's not as critical, right? The level of explainability or transparency. Um, so in that case, maybe you're okay knowing, you know, just 75% of the information. So it again depends on the use case, depend and it depends on the, you know, what is crucial for the stakeholders in your organization. It's a conversation that you need to have to define what's the acceptable level of tolerance for this specific use case, and then you make that informed choice. Uh, I, I just want to tip tip of the hat yeah. to you on the example of um, patient diagnosis versus bed allocation. I'm go, going through some a health journey with my mom at the moment, and, and that that I think that really lays it out right. It's a continuum, and that continuum is itself context specific. And thanks, Bina. Yeah. And so the other thing is, it's it's your choice. No organization is forced to use AI if they don't fully trust it. So it is up to the organization to, you know, to decide very proactively. The era of AI that we are living in, uh, in the context of trust, it is to reduce unintended consequences. For too long, we've been getting away with, you know, saying, oh, we didn't think about it. What needs to change now in this inflection point is reduce the number of unintended consequences. It doesn't mean that you're going to get it perfectly right from every aspect. But for your use case, if that perfectly uh, you know, right, accurate is important, don't, you know, you, you'll have to wait. You'll have to build your own completely reliable, perfect algorithm. Yeah, maybe I'll add something there really quickly, Talbot. I think we're entering this um, discussion of it's not build versus buy, it's build and buy. Uh, you buy and build. So a lot of the models mm -hmm. that we see today, open source models, available pre-trained models, applications are great. You know, they help us accelerate to building an AI application or tool, but they require retraining. They require specific context for the problem as Bina mentioned, we're trying to solve for the specific um, uh, reliability uh, benchmark, the specific, amount of trust you need to build into the model. And so, yes, we expect that we're gonna have, we can buy applications, you can, you can use open source models from different places, but there's always gonna be some aspect of making sure that you use it in the context that you, are, you, you, you need. So there's always gonna be either some sort of customization or some sort of development. Mm. Thank you for that. Um, are, are we okay to reflect a little bit on what 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 do we do? What do organizations do if and when things go wrong? Take ownership and we've seen it and we're going to continue to see it. And we've whether it is, you know, uh, withdrawing a recruiting algorithm because it was biased or, uh, you know, removing a racist chatbot because it didn't have the right guardrails in place till you can put the guardrails in place and redeploy it. I think taking accountability, being a responsible citizen, and you know, be, having that ability to roll back is the absolutely, um, you know, is absolutely important in this era of you know rapidly emerging technologies. Mm. That's a really nice point. I mean, um, I, I had an, an old uh, an old friend and colleague who used to say that you can't um, you can't shrink your way to success. And, and mm -hmm. I love that quote because, you know, it's this sort of this idea that, you know, you, you lean six sigma efficiency effective, that's all swell. But if you're not pioneering and growing, you're not, you're, you, well, you're not much. And that's all to say, I, I think if, if people turn off the entirety of their work and their exploration of this space, because they, they, they have a failure, then, then they're not managing risk. They're running from it. And so I, I really like your point, Bina, that um, owning it in the same way we own anything we do with technology, we recognize it's a force multiplier yep. used intentionally and mindfully, it can amplify good. 
right? With a mind towards externalities and the rest. Um, but pardon the expression, you know, what, what weapons in the hands of children is, is no good. And, and so and so let's be adults here. Yeah, you know? yeah absolutely. There was a very interesting comment on, um, you know, is there a opportunity for, or is there a, like a trust, ethical trusted trademark uh, that could be established as a, you know, seal of approval that particular, you know, AI has been created in a transparent glass box manner. Like, do, do, do you know, like, do, 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 you, you see what the question, like, is is there a, 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 an opportunity? I, I just don't know. But um, <laughs> could that be part of a solution, Dina? Uh, you know, I you're going to get tired of me saying this. It depends. <laughs> it really depends on the use case. Right. Yeah. If you are go using AI, uh, you know, in uh, for stock predicting, you know, stock value versus again patient diagnosis, or AI for, uh, you know, tagging somebody as criminals versus AI for rescuing human trafficking victims, you know, it could be the same underlying model, but the data it's been trained on and the outcomes it's driving is going to define the metrics to which to hold it hold it to. So it really depends on uh, you know on the use case can i just add i think I, I totally agree with bina in addition i would say they exist there are many trademarks certifications that are coming up every day now is that going to help yeah sure we can get certified we can get a trademark get a stamp great but the you know i think the focus for organization needs to be the underlying values the foundations the principles that's where trust is built. And then, yes, we should have these trademarks and certifications and all of that. That's good. That's great. And having an external perspective on that is good because you need best practices on all of that. But really, trust builds from ground up. It's uh... linking it to the organizational values. I caught you say that. That's actually really important. And then having the courage to actually live those values throughout the process of developing algorithms and being honest enough and being courageous enough to stop things or to call them out or to own them if things don't go the way you envisioned this this is actually very, this is one of those like technology is, is it, technology is there and capabilities are there this is really a, a human a human question to solve right mm -hmm. the human question that needs to be owned, that needs to be owned. Um, and that's, that's I think, risk here, eh? I, I think you're right. I mean, you know, I, in our team's work, you know, granted, we're, as, as futurists, we're always kind of looking at the mountains beyond the mountains and the, the, the what if, what, you know, what about. And um, what, one of my team members said a couple of months ago, I thought it was really interesting. She said, you know, we've gotten really comfortable with the idea of mechanical muscles, right? Um, physical robotics, um, automated mm. making of say cars or something. Um, something about mechanical minds puts us in a different, well, mind space. Oh yeah. And, and, and that idea, again, this is me in a brainstormy mode, not an evaluative mode. The, the, this idea of, you know, um, handmade products have a place and a value. And for Bina's insight, um, in certain markets that, you know, it depends certain markets. Like I want a handmade artisanal something. And I think, I think we, you know, again, futurist mojo, you can imagine a world where, um, um, you know, human created artwork will, will have a, you know, whether it's a trademark or certification or a, a blockchain based stamp on a public Ethereum chain, uh, the idea of artisanal as applied to thought might, might itself have a market. Wow. That's a, that's a big, that's a big thought, actually. <laughs> I mean, right. Or like certified organic. Uh, cert, it's a certified, you know, hu certified human thought. Yeah. I mean, <laughs> and, and again, it, it feels disconcerting because these things always do, but yeah. Futurists were historians. We look back and we say, okay, we we've been there, you know, is this handmade or, or this not is, in both. Wow. This, this is, this is actually a very, very interesting train of thinking that you just, 
that you just sort of scratched the surface on, Mike. I, I can I can see a report coming out of this of, of that one. Uh, so Bina and Nihar, given that of course you spend all of your time in the domain of artificial intelligence and trust and ethics, I'd love for you to, as we sort of are navigating to the end of this time, to to maybe. Uh, comment on where organizations, not just where should they start, but what should be the first few steps, right? This is where you start, and here is how it likely ought to evolve. Um, so what, what would be your response to that? If, how would you advise an organization to where to start, and what would be then the next two, three steps? Nihar, do you want to? Yeah, I'll go first, for sure. There's uh, so many things I can think of where to start. Um, it starts with what I went, mentioned early on, which is build awareness. Uh, you got to break some of the myths around the organizations to make sure that we understand what we're trying to build. So let's say if you know an organization is looking to build a fraud detection AI tool, let's have a conversation about what it is going to look like, who's going to use it, how is it going to be built, you know, just having that discussion, building education awareness around AI and what it can do, cannot do, and getting the people who are actually going to use the tool in the conversation early is where we see success happening. And so first step to answer your question, Dalpur, is create that openness across the organization to talk about AI make it a topic of discussion that's easy to have as opposed to, you know, we don't want to talk about that because it's going to start leading that leading leading us down a rabbit hole. So that mm -hmm. that that is that is probably the most important thing. And second, going back to some of the things that we mentioned earlier, create trust in data. So have good data principles, data governance principles, and create that culture of strong data governance. Be and I will just add to, uh, in the continuum is, you know, to continuously monitor, uh, where, you know, reevaluate your governance structures because the new next wave of AI is just around the corner and it's going to bring additional risk. Um, and even your models, the software that you roll out are going to keep changing. So I think ML ops in the context of trust is absolutely important. So it's not a once and done your AI fluency to your, you know, uh, governance, everything has to be periodically evaluated and adjusted. Mm -hmm. This is very good. So here is what I captured as in steps. Number one, awareness. Number two, involvement of people who are going to be impacted. Ideally, bring them on along for the, for the whole experience, for the whole ride, as we know that people trust in things that they help create. Then third, investment in data, data clarity, data accuracy, data transparency, investment in algorithm transparency, and making it, how you started, Bina, in making it all based on a specific use case. So bringing it down to a real problem, real opportunity, not keeping it up at the organizational level, because it is there's nothing you can do with that. Of course, we all want to be ethical. Of course, we all want our organizations to abide by the guiding principles, but making this really specific to a use case, right? Excellent. So um, I want to thank you very much. This was a fascinating conversation. I have learned a lot from all of you. Thank you so very much. For our audience members, thank you very much for, for spending an hour with us. Um, I'm going to just mention that two weeks from now, uh, Mike Bechtel and I are going to reconvene in this forum as we unpack the multi-cloud chaos. We are going to be joined by two experts on these topics, David, David Linthicum, who is our global chief cloud strategy officer at Deloitte, and Kevin Young, our Canadian cloud leader. So I would encourage you and welcome you back to that session two weeks from now. And I would like to wish you all a very happy Wednesday. Thank you all very much. Thank you. Thanks, Talibor. Thank you. Bye-bye.